Welcome everyone, this is Veganic Living and I'm your host, Kim Smith. Today my guest is Chef AJ. Chef AJ has been devoted to a plant-based diet for almost 40 years. She's the host of the television series Healthy Living with Chef AJ, which airs on Foodie TV. With her comedy background, she has made appearances on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and The Late Show with David Letterman, and more. A chef, culinary instructor, and professional speaker, she is the author of a popular book, Unprocessed, How to Achieve Vibrant Health and Your Ideal Weight, which chronicles her journey from a junk food vegan faced with a diagnosis of precancerous polyps to learning how to create foods that nourish and heal the body. She just came out with a new book this year, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, a revolutionary approach to conquering cravings, overcoming food addiction, and losing weight without going hungry. Based in Los Angeles, Chef AJ teaches how to create meals to transform health, how to deal with cravings and food addiction, and addresses the emotional side of eating. She is the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, also the creator of Healthy Taste of LA, and the YouTube cooking show, The Chef and the Dietitian. Chef AJ holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University and is a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We had so much fun recording this. I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. I want to thank you so much well, for doing the podcast. My pleasure. It worked out good. And, and I have to say, I just got done reading your book about a week ago. Thank you. And I love it, and I want to talk about it. But there is one thing I want to bring up first. Sure. It's the, the vegan movement is growing so fast, and it's amazing to see... The, the vegan foods and restaurants and everything going up, but there's I think there's a little bit of a misconception that just because you go vegan, you're going to be thin. <gasps> oh, that's been going on a long time, and also there's another misconception that just because you're vegan, you're going to be healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, last September, I spoke at the Veg Fest in San Francisco, and my talk was called Eat Up, Slim Down, and Get Healthy. It was my calorie density talk, chapter two of the book. And there was a lady in the front row that was very new to veganism. She goes, well, I don't understand why you're giving this talk. Aren't all vegans healthy? Aren't all vegans thin? And I said, well, actually, no. And I think the fact that so many junk foods exist now that are vegan makes it easier in some ways for people to become vegan because they don't have to give up, quote, their favorite foods. But at the same time, somebody that is is vulnerable to being overweight is not going to necessarily be slender substituting one junk food for another just because it doesn't have animal products you know I love how Dr. Goldhammer says that if you're vegan that's my mentor Dr. Alan Goldhammer he's the co-founder of the True North Health Center and of the pleasure trap he says you know being vegan can assure you a place in heaven but it doesn't guarantee how fast you'll get there. <laughs> and right. so I've been sharing my story for a long time, even before I lost weight, because I'm, I'm relatively new to this weight loss arena. I've only been thin for you know, six and a half years of my 58 years. But I've been sharing my story even before that because I had been vegan for 26 years from September 1st, 1977, to January 1st, 2003, when I woke up bleeding from precancerous polyps. So I, I had gotten the beginning of colon cancer even being on a vegan diet for 26 years because I was eating a lot of processed food and oil and sugar and flour and salt. I wasn't drinking alcohol, but having lots of caffeine in the form of Coke Slurpees for breakfast and Dr. Peppers for lunch. And I thought the same thing. It's like, well, how can I get sick? How can, you know, I, I'm vegan, but it, it doesn't... It doesn't discriminate. Junk is junk, whether it comes from a orange and blue box called Kraft or or one of these other products. And 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 sometimes, you know, I speak at Veg Fest, which I'm always surprised when they ask me because they're usually junk food festivals. Mm-hmm. Not not the one we're at today. Not health, healing, happiness with healthy food, but these Veg Fests where they have like seven vegan donut vendors and mm-hmm. vegan ice cream. You know, maple bacon donuts <laughs> that are vegan. And you, I speak at these Veg Fests. And there's not one thing I can eat. There's not a single fruit and vegetable. And so I, I'm, you know, my husband says, well, you shouldn't be bashing it because at least they're not eating animals. And I think it's great when people don't eat animals. Don't get me wrong. But if they're going to sacrifice their own health, that's not a good thing either. Because mm-hmm. then 
what I've seen happen, because not too many people have been vegan for 41 years like me, I have seen people, because they fail on vegan diets, because they eat junk food instead of whole food, go back to not being vegan. Right. Uh, you know, most of us don't have Dr. McDougall as our doctor or, or a plant-based doctor, so we get sick because of our diet, and then, of course, it's always blamed on being vegan, mm-hmm. right? So, oh, always. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're healthy, and doesn't because you're vegan doesn't mean you're going to be thin. That said, if you pick the healthiest version of the vegan diet, which I believe is the whole food plant-based diet, whole foods over processed foods, and definitely no oil. We can talk about sugar and salt and things like that later, but I would I would argue that at least most of the, not most, but I think all of the vegan doctors that I respect would say no oil. I think you have a really good shot at both health and an appropriate or ideal body weight. But it's, it's a tough sell because people like their junk food. They're addicted to the sugar and the fat, and and they don't like when you take it away, so. They don't. Yeah, but, but, but people get to choose. I mean, it's, I always tell people it's, this isn't a court-ordered uh, program or diet, and they get to choose what they want. And it's hard because, you know, I just came from hearing Dr. Furman's lecture on food addiction, and it, it really is hard because people are addicted to sugar, fat, and salt, whether it's in the animal product world or the vegan world, and it's hard for them to give it up. It, it is hard. And, you know, you don't hear much about... Um, when I was younger, it was like people did want to get off salt. Yeah. And you don't hear about that no. at all anymore. You know, it's just unless in everything. It, it's, it's, uh, salt is actually, you know, believe it or not, Kim, it's harder for most people than sugar and, and, and oil. For, it's, uh, it was it's, the it, last thing I Yeah, it, it, it is yeah. hard. And <laughs> I, I love Dr. Furman's lecture yesterday because I was taking notes. He was saying it's carcinogenic and he was saying, he was making it sound even worse than, than I had realized about it. You know, I think because Americans eat something like over 92% of their uh, food from animal products and processed foods, something like I think it's 67 to 72% from processed food, that's where all the salt is hidden. Mm -hmm. So you could be eating a loaf of bread. You know, they have some of these delicious bread vendors here, and the bread doesn't even taste salty. Mm -hmm. But there's actually more salt in the bread than if you were to eat, like, French fries or potato chips. So we're getting so much of our sodium now hidden in the processed food, and and it doesn't even taste salty necessarily. So, yeah, I mean, unless somebody already has high blood pressure or, or heart disease or on medication you're right you never hear I've never heard from any doctor to ever reduce salt Mm -mm, yeah Um, I also want to talk about the oil because it's really hard to to tell people it's not healthy yeah it's very junk food Uh, well it is hard and it's funny because if you if you look up junk food one of the definitions in the dictionary it'll say it's a food that is no nutrients and high in calorie and so most people even if they eat sugar will not argue that sugar is a health food they know it's empty calories and it's interesting because sugar as bad as it is is only 1800 calories per pound yet oil which in my opinion fits the definition of a junk food because it's very high in calories it's more than double the caloric density of sugar it's 4000 calories per pound it has no fiber it has no nutrients and yet people think of it as this holy grail and that that it's going to help them, I don't know, you know, with all kinds of things. You know, you hear on television, oh, it's heart healthy, extra virgin olive oil. And even if it were healthy, and I don't agree that it is, it's so calorically dense. How can anybody, who are these people that are eating oil? You know, I don't get it because I remember when I first heard Dr. Esselstyn speak, in 2008, we went SOS-free, sugar-free, oil-free, and salt-free. I think it was June 1st, 2008. And when I took oil out of the diet, which actually was really easy compared to sugar and salt, mm-hmm. it's you just you know you can still have fat, you can have nuts and seeds and avocado if you want. We took it out, and I didn't tell my husband. And about seven months later, he had lost like 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 eight pounds. And my husband's already thin, mm. and he didn't know that he was uh, being experimented on against his, <laughs> his his will. And and I always said, you know, if somebody that doesn't need to lose weight, that doesn't want to lose weight, that doesn't even know that there's been a dietary change, can lose that much, you know, more than a pound a month, not eating oil. Imagine what an overweight person could accomplish if they gave it up on person. But again, you know, these high fat foods, these high caloric foods they produce more dopamine in the brain and that's why people like them it, it's not the taste guys for olive oil if it is people if they would had be, to 
it take a spoonful? It, it, they throw I, up. Yeah, it's exactly. nasty. It's the, the only way oil tastes good is if you add a lot of salt. And so when you stop using oil, you don't need as much salt because oil actually coats the taste buds of the tongue and kind of makes like a blanket over it so that you need a lot of salt to taste it. And this this nonsense that coconut oil is a miracle. You know, I, I remember that your plant-based doctor here in Las Vegas, Evan Allen, in the movie Eating You Alive, said the only miracle is that people actually <laughs> believe that it's, it's a miracle. And, and how could our ancestors have eaten coconut oil? They're, 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 have you ever tried to open a coconut? In culinary school, we had to do it. It's really, really hard. Mm-hmm. And, even you know, if you want to eat a little coconut, maybe eat some coconut, but not the oil. It's, Nobody it's, pressed it back then. Exactly. Yeah. It's so <laughs> high in saturated fat and more, more saturated fat in coconut oil than lard. But, you know, I know there's people that swear by it, and they say, eat fat, get thin. I You know, I, 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 don't, I don't see it. No. I don't, I don't I see don't it happening either. in people I know and my clients, so... No, not yep. at all. Uh, and how many olives does it take for one tablespoon? Like of 41, olive? I heard. That's insane. I've never eaten 41 olives. Would you sit olives. down and eat that many olives? Most people would. People wouldn't. don't think about putting a tablespoon or two or more uh, on absolutely. a salad. Absolutely. Well, what about corn oil? It takes about 16 years of corn to make a tablespoon of corn oil. That's I've crazy. never met anybody that could eat 16. <laughs> I mean, after three years, you'd be. F- I, I was. I, I tried once. I was really full after three years of corn. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny, yeah. Um, it, it is hard because everybody thinks, but olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, and unfortunately, that was the thing they looked at selling. Right. Well, also the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet, maybe they feel it's healthier, not because of the oil, but because it eliminates the flowers and the sugars right. and and some of those other things in a lot of the animal products. And so maybe people can be healthy in spite of the olive oil, not because of not mm-hmm. because of it. It's still, if I understand correctly, it's still a pretty high fat diet, like 30 percent. Mm-hmm. So and again, you know, I, I mean, I don't know how people can just ignore the work of Dr. Esselstyn and the scientific studies that he's published, at least when it comes to heart disease and his ability to reverse it. And Dr. Dean Ornish with the low fat diet so I don't know you know I guess if it works for you keep doing it but I don't see a lot of people gaining health especially if their goal is weight loss eating eating a lot of fat especially no, a lot of oil know. and it I think it it dulls your taste buds completely mm-hmm. from actually tasting the food it does I, I just will sit down and eat plain vegetables and love them. yep yeah me too yeah uh, you and I both took um T. Colin Campbell's yeah, course. Yeah, great course. And uh, that that's that was a real eye opener with Dr. Esselstyn mm-hmm. for me in 2012. Yeah, or even in t- they talk about it in Forks Over Knives, where they mm-hmm. show the graphic, uh, the graph, and the endothelial cells, and how the oil, you know, creates a sludge and it slows down the blood flow and you know c- contributes to heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. But man, it's a huge industry. People just like you know, Dr. McDougall says people always want good news about their bad mm-hmm. habits. The last thing they want is bad news about their bad habits. Exactly. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. Nope. nope. Sugar, oil, salt. salt. Yeah. Uh-huh. The evil trinity, I the, call it. Yes, they are. Yeah. I like your your sofas. Yeah, so so yeah, when I when I started the ultimate weight loss program, I Dr. Goldhammer, I believe coined the term SOS free sugar oil salt free and what was happening is people were thinking that, oh, yeah, but I can still have alcohol mm-hmm. and I can still have flour. And, and I'm not saying you can't, but if you're a food addict, and especially one that wants to lose weight, I don't recommend it. So I put those other two letters in there, the A and the second, um, the A, yeah, put the A for alcohol and the F for flour, and it actually it's spelled sofas, which actually worked out nice because I always <laughs> tell people if they want to lose weight and get healthy, get off their sofas, both literally <laughs> and figuratively. So sofa, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt. So maybe maybe one day I'll be known for that ac- acronym. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I, I you know Dr. Goldhammer said that sugar did imply all the refined carbohydrates like flour, but a lot of people were were not understanding so, that yeah. at least somebody that struggles with their weight or food addiction, flour can be every bit as detrimental as sugar, it can be as addictive, and again, it's it's high calorie, it's, it's 1,500 calories per pound, whereas the whole grain that the flour is milled from is only 500 calories per pound, plus it's got the fiber and the water and the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants and micronutrients. 
everything I wrote in my first book eight years ago on process, I still stand by today. It, we're just not, in my opinion, meant to eat processed food. You know, Dr. Furman was saying in his lecture today that that, uh, that throughout human history there were no overweight humans except for kings and queens because they weren't eating, you know, the, mm. the, the natural diet. And if we just go back to not eating processed food, what uh, we're, we're going to do so much better. Yeah. Well, let's talk about more more about calorie density. I love calorie density yes. because it's it's scientific and it's not emotional. I used to have clients that would beat themselves up, oh, I was bad because I ate a cookie. Hey, I was good today. I ate kale. And I try to explain to them you're not you're neither bad nor good because of what you eat. You're either eating in a calorically dense way, which is what most Americans do with animal products and processed foods and oils and sugar and flour, or you're eating in a calorie dilute way, which is how our ancestors ate throughout most of human history fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And I, on the back of my book, I have my chart, and, and you can also get it on my website. And it's I, I told people just eat to the left of the red line to simplify it because all the foods to the left of the red line, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes are 100 to 600 calories per pound. And the research shows if you eat to the left of the red line, you can pretty much eat ad libitum and as much as you want, as often as you want, whenever you want, until comfortably full and still achieve and maintain your ideal weight or very close to it. But as I said earlier, if we're eating 92% of our calories from animal products and processed food, these are things to the right of the red line. And I think that's why probably 70% of Americans now are overweight or obese. There are a couple foods to the right of the red line that are not processed foods, the avocado, nuts, and seeds, but they are calorically dense. So I tell people to at least be mindful of them and not, and those are not the ones you want to eat at libitum. You don't want to just take a, you know, a three pound bag of, of macadamia nuts and, and eat it. That's not a good idea. Yeah, nuts are hard that. to open for a reason. Right, like it, it, that's the thing. You know, we didn't have uh, throughout history or in nature nuts and seeds that were shelled. I mean, avocados were seasonal as well. Our ancestors were nomadic. So you're right. If I would, if you if you have to open each one by itself, you're not going to be eating pounds of them. You know, you're probably going to give up after like a few. <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. When when I was little, my grandparents had them in the shells, and you cracked them open. And, and yeah. You know, and after like three, you're like, okay, I'm yeah, done with this. Uh, Plus, they weren't roasted and salted, you Mm -hmm. know, where now it's even a a, a bigger whammy because you're getting these high fat bombs that are now even made higher fat because they're roasted in oil and then even more hyper palatable because they're salted. And then most people can't resist and eat just one. Mm -hmm. Um, How long do you think it usually will take somebody coming from the standard American diet to feel comfortable mm. on a whole food plant-based diet. That is going to depend on the person and how standard their standard American <laughs> diet was. You know, I heard Dr. Furman say today it can take a good six months for you actually to like this food. Mm-hmm. That's a process that they talk about at True North called neuroadaptation. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody is different. I think it depends on how long they've been eating the way they've been eating and how addicted they are to the pleasure trap. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is where I work it's Christmas. I, I spend the last two weeks of the year in Santa Rosa at the True North Health Center, which is a medically supervised therapeutic water only fasting center. And when people undergo a, a medically supervised water fast, they can actually enjoy the food a lot sooner than if they're eating it on their eating. own. Right. <laughs> but, but when people try to do it themselves, a lot of times they they don't want to commit 100% and they're still letting some of these foods slip in. And so they never really get used to the healthy food. Mm-hmm. But I've seen people in as little as a week and I've seen people you know three months it uh-huh. depends it uh, that is it's and that I think is the problem is they give up before they achieve that neuroadaptation mm-hmm. and 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 the joy and the liking of the food and it's hard because they're being pulled in all kinds of directions from their their social circles their family other people don't eat like this and so it's it, unless you find a group of like-minded people most people aren't going to do this on their own and be the only man the only woman right. oddball you know, eating kale when everybody else is eating at McDonald's. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think I was in a way lucky because I used to have a lot of allergic reactions mm. to foods. So I had to give them up or be miserable. Yeah. I, there was one time I was covered in head to toe with um, hives that were the size of quarters. Wow. And it lasted for three weeks before it finally went away. Mm. 
you learn not to eat things that way. Yeah. So it, it's a, a hard way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of easier ways. But do you think if somebody wants to come into your program, they could start adding fruits and vegetables yeah. to their meals so it kind of is a little easier yeah. to yeah. to get their, you know, put yeah. their toes in the water? Yeah. You know, so like you mentioned, sometimes these health opportunities are, are actually blessings in disguise because they keep us on the right course. So my program, the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, is what you call an abstinence-based program. So it is whole food plant-based. I am vegan, and that's what I promote. But the, the giving up of the items that are causing people to be, as Dr. Goldhammer says, fat, sick, and miserable, the sugar, the processed sugars and flours and the oils, and uh, in, in some cases, alcohol and salt, a lot of people don't like the idea of giving stuff up. Mm -hmm. So I would say before you even consider ultimate weight loss, unless you're really ready and maybe you have a diagnosis that you really have to do this now, is to get my first book on process and do just the plant-based recipes that are a little bit richer, that include some of the nuts and seeds so they're more hyper palatable but you're still not having the sugar and the oil and the salt but maybe having some richer recipes before you go on a low fat diet because it can take you know a while to get used to a lower fat diet if you're used to eating a lot of fat mm -hmm. so I think it's going to depend on the person but it is hard and, and again we're at this health conference here in Vegas and I love how Dr. Furman said you know you're just going to have to get used to being uncomfortable for a while mm -hmm. because going through withdrawal and detoxification it you know that you are going to experience some symptoms. And I think people don't want to have to go through that discomfort. Yeah, it's a lot easier than having, you know, to be rushed in an ambulance to the hospital <laughs> later yeah. on, though. That's that's for sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's usually what's here and now that people... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I heard something once, and I don't know if this is true with food, but I could see how it could be for some people, that, um, that the, the actual act of smoking a cigarette is really not enjoyable in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Now, the person is addicted, so they might be thinking that they enjoy it, but really, just, just smoking a cigarette is not enjoyable, but what a person I is experiencing is to avoiding the pain of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So in other words, n if you're addicted to tobacco, to nicotine, to cigarettes, not smoking cigarettes is going to be very painful. Mm -hmm. And so when you smoke a cigarette, you're like, you get that relief, but that relief isn't true pleasure. Right, right. But what it is, is avoidance of the pain of withdrawal. And so people that are addicted to the pleasure trap, and by the way, if you don't know what I mean by the pleasure trap, uh, it's a book now also available on audio CD, narrated by me, I might <laughs> add, by Drs. Doug Lyle and Dr. Alan Goldhammer. And the, um, so, why did I say the pleasure trap? Oh, see, now I, I should have taken notes. I don't remember what I'm saying. But 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 um, people that are stuck in the pleasure trap that, that have this, um, what do you want to call it, an addiction or just, you know, unable to stop eating certain foods, mm -hmm. I would I would argue that for some people it's much like the cigarette smoker who doesn't really get pleasure from the, 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 the cigarette smoke but avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm the people that are really addicted to sugar and flour and things like that, they've habituated to like a certain use of these drugs mm -hmm. or these foods that are dr drug-like mm -hmm. so that like maybe the very first time you eat a, you know, a fast food meal at a fast food restaurant or have a hot fudge sundae, you're like, oh wow, this is great. But the second time it's, you don't get as much pleasure. And then the third and the fourth and the hundredth time, you're now eating these foods, not really to experience the pleasure that you had the first time, but to avoid pain, to mm -hmm. avoid the, the withdrawal uh, the pain that comes with the detoxification withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So um, now you have a Facebook group. Yeah. So you have a lovely community of people. Right. That uh, that will help support and that have gone through it. You and betcha. Will yeah. Talk to people. Do they ever bring up their um, any detox symptoms? Oh yeah, all of them. I mean, the, the, it's so funny. The people that are new, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they can be anything from you know headaches to to severe headaches like migraines, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting irritability, crying, um, um, tiredness, le lethargy, if, if that's how you know that these are drugs. You know, like if you, if, if for some reason you had to stop eating kale for whatever reason, you'd be fine. Even, fine. If, yeah. Yeah, even if you were eating it every day, that's how you know it's so potent. It's like people like with coffee, for example, mm -hmm. 
these are not these are drugs these are not benign things because if you stop coffee after habitual use mm-hmm. you're going to have like the worst headache of your life right. probably for days mm-hmm. and so that's how you know that these are not these are drugs not food and the same thing happens with these drug like foods like sugar and oil and flour and it definitely we know what happens with alcohol mm-hmm. so i remember when i first detoxed off of white sugar in 2003 i mean it was it, the first week was the worst, mm-hmm. uh, but it was a good three weeks of crying every day, you know. Uh, but the first, you know, and again, not everybody's is severe, and, and especially if you're at a place like the Optimum Health Institute where I was or at the True North Health Center where you're being supported and you're mm-hmm. not having to work, it, the detox can go a lot easier. But it's not easy, and the thing is, is if you want the results, you have to go through it, and most people aren't going to go through that discomfort. It's mm-hmm. just, it's it's too hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't help to tell them that when they get through the other side, they'll have a lean body, they'll have health, because they're looking at right now how uncomfortable they are, and most exactly. people don't want to do it. Most people usually wait till there's some kind of health crisis. Right. They've mm-hmm. gotten a cancer diagnosis, or diabetes, or heart disease, or autoimmune disease, and then now they're going to do something about it. But even then, it's still, it's not any easier just because you have a diagnosis Mm -hmm. because addiction is a very hard thing to beat and like you said we have the private Facebook group it's secret and private for people that are in the ultimate weight loss program and soon we'll have a subscription based board but yeah because they see people that have gone through it and it's like you know if they know they're not alone and they know they're not going crazy because a lot of times doctors won't even admit that things like sugar are are addictive and so why should they be experience symptoms when they give it up but it's nice to have other people that have already gone through it and, and reached reach the other side yeah they can help yeah absolutely because yeah. we can under you know we can't go through it for you but we can support you and understand um, what you're going through because we've gone through it and, and we know it's going to pass this too shall pass but it's it's very addiction is very very hard thing to overcome mm-hmm. which is why the recidivism rate for all addictions is whether it's food addiction or alcoholism or even smoking it's really high because the best advice I can give people is don't start you know yes. uh, it, it's it, you know I have a friend who is an alcoholic and she says she you know, it's not her fault because both her parents were alcoholics. And I say, you know, you're right. It's not your fault that you have the genetic uh, vulnerability to alcoholism. And I don't even like the word fault. But if you had chosen to never take a drink of alcohol, there's no way you'd be alcoholic today. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, these these drug-like foods like the sugar and the flour and the oil, we've been fed salt since we were little. Mm-hmm. It's in baby formula, for God's sakes. So it's not the person's fault that they're addicted to these foods. Mm-hmm. It's it's natural and normal to eat the most concentrated source of calories in the environment, but our our we've been hijacked. You know we we've uh, our, we get become addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine from these foods, and once we're hooked, it's very hard to get out of the trap. It's very hard, and that's what I've dedicated my life's work to interviewing people like Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer to explain what this trap is, why it's so easy to fall into, and why it's so hard to get out of. I think that's one thing I really love about your work is that there aren't people out there really talking about the addiction of it. And if they are, they're not usually telling people a real healthy way to yeah. get past it. Right. They'll they'll say, you know, put your food on a smaller plate, mm-hmm. take 32 bites, be mindful, put your fork down, you know, weigh and measure your food on a plate. And, and that'll work. I mean, a short term, I don't know how many people can keep doing it. But it's not going to solve the problem, and uh, it's and because you don't have to starve yourself. Oh my God! It's like if if people would watch on YouTube my show Weight Loss Wednesday, I believe it's episode 36, and I show what I eat in a day. It's an incredible amount of food in terms of how much because I'm eating low calorie calorie dilute food, so I can eat greater volumes. And I think some days I eat between eight and ten pounds of food a day, where the average person eats between three and five. So I'm eating almost double now as a slender person than. I ever did when I was overweight or obese and and I'm enjoying it a lot more because part of satiety has to do with how much you see you're going to eat and and plus I love the food now did I always love it no I mean I had to choke the kale down but uh, now I love it and I, I love yeah. your <laughs> you're an adult just too that's right well that's the thing it's like you know I, one of the things that uh, like uh, that got 
put out there on social media when I did this Health Healing Happiness Conference a few years ago and somebody review, uh, interviewed me. I said, you know, just grow up and eat your damn vegetables. <laughs> and, you know, I, since when it, it, when you are, in a, and even if you're a child, you don't have to like something to do it. I mean, a lot of people don't like their jobs, but yet they get up and go to them every day successfully. You know, liking something has, and this was thrown in my face at the age of 52 when I still wasn't exercising and my partner, John Pierre, you know, said, you, you know how ridiculous you sound? You tell people to eat vegetables even if they don't like them. And because I, I said, I don't like exercising. You know, it's true that if you like something, you might be more willing to do it or do it sooner, but you don't have to like something to do it. And in the case of vegetables or healthy food, the more you do it, the more you'll eventually learn to like it because you will get used to these these new tastes and textures. And when you see what these vegetables are doing, for not just for your waistline, but your skin and your brain chemistry, you will actually learn to love them. You can prefer to like healthy food as much or more than your current diet, but this can take months and most people will not wait for results like that. And you know what's sad is is everybody thinks that uh, I'm in my 50s too. I feel like when you hit your 50s, you're going to be aches and aches and pains, and and your your life is just going to go downhill from there. And it's the opposite. Uh -uh. If you're eating uh -huh. the way we're meant to eat, yeah. it, I have just as much energy, if not more, than I did when I went uh, vegan when I was 25. So I, it's it's a good thing and you're never too old to do this no never, never oh it's funny old. that you said that because last week I went to a funeral for one of my students who just passed away at almost the age of 97 and she didn't come to my class till she was 88 and have had lost two children one from uh, diabetes and one from um, cancer and so it's, it is never too late now I mean there's certain things you know you could argue they're probably irreparable like if somebody has gone blind from diabetes mm -hmm. or lost a limb they're I mean, I, I, I listen. I, I, I'm open to the possibility that there could be, you know, regeneration <laughs> at some point, or we have the technology for the people I've known that have lost, you know, sight and limbs from diabetes. Like that is not reversible, mm -hmm. but so many of the other things are. And you know, all the plant-based doctors have written books and, and and shown success stories of their patients who have reversed, you know, type two diabetes, who have lessened the need for medication for type one, who have completely you know, reverse their heart disease and their autoimmune disease. So there's a success story after success story. You can just go on Dr. McDougall's website and poke on the, the link that takes you to Star McDougallers. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, I mean, you know, it's like Dr. Greger says, you know, if the plant-based diet, if the only thing it did was reverse heart disease, shouldn't it be the default diet? Exactly. But it does so much more. I mean, it, it causes you to have clear skin. It if it helps you lose weight. It helps you sleep better. It, uh, you know, it can reverse all these diseases of lifestyle. You know, I can't promise everybody if they're listening, if they have cancer, will they reverse it? You know, it's just that's a very... A challenging disease to have. There's so many different kinds and so many different stages. But I have heard from different people that, yes, they have reversed mm -hmm. it. You know, maybe not with something like pancreatic cancer. I've, I've heard people that have lived longer mm -hmm. by changing their diet. But some of the people will tell you, yeah, absolutely, they've they've gotten well from that. But you, oh, the thing Ruth is. Hydric. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, breast cancer, right? Yes, doing McDougall's program. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can't just change your diet and get better and then go back to the diet, though. Yeah. That's the mistake people mm -hmm. make even with weight loss. They can do my program. They can do any program for a while, get results. But if they don't keep doing what they did to lose weight and gain health, they will then gain the weight back and then gain their ill health back as well. And that is the hardest thing for people because people are looking, Kim, for a short-term fix, not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a diet, not a lifestyle. Right. And uh, I guess it's a tough sell because there's pleasure. I mean, here we are in Las Vegas. I mean, to me, Las mm -hmm. Vegas is a pleasure trap. I mean, it's funny because I, I, I live in Los Angeles. And I almost never see anyone smoke anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like when I see people, and it's so rare that you see somebody smoking in L.A. that when I see it, I'm like, oh, people still smoke. smoke yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. and, you know, and then yet here, yeah, and then you, get here. <laughs> you walk through the casino and just seeing the ashtrays with the cigarettes, butts, I'm like, wow, people do smoke. And I personally don't drink alcohol. I don't know very many people that do. But, I mean, this is all about, you know, all the pleasure traps and all the, the artificial simulation of dopamine. So we see this, the smoke and the drinking and then all the you know all the hyper palatable mm -hmm. food and you know the buffets and and, 
Sometimes to indulge. It really mm -hmm. is. I mean, that's why they call it, they, they, instead of Sin City, maybe they should call it Dopamine City. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, because, uh, you know, and then the, all all the, uh, you know, and, and just, you know, and that, you know, the way the women are dressed to, to serve the alcohol, not putting them down at all. Mm -hmm. They're gorgeous women, but it's like everything is to entice you f to have more pleasure and, uh, but read the pleasure trap because there is a price to be paid for, Definitely. for short term pleasure. <laughs> and it's kind of sad because Las Vegas has, has gone by the wayside of the entertainment capital mm -hmm. of the world where you see incredibly talented people, uh, performing and that goes by the wayside. But like you said, the people smoking right. in the casino, not getting sunlight and eating bad things and drinking. It's, it's crazy. It's really, yeah, you know, yeah, it's funny because, kind of um, I, I saw just when I was coming in this hotel, I saw a gentleman, you know, morbidly obese in, in a wheelchair and, um, and he was smoking and drinking oh, and no. I'm like, okay, well now, you know, I wasn't, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I'm like, well, I kind of know why, you, how you got here. Yeah. And you know, you talk about the celebrities that, you know, that you see the billboards for like people like JLo. I'm pretty sure she's not eating the way that the, the people the, that are coming right. to the show are. I mean, I, I'm sure she has really good, I, I don't know if she's, I don't think she's vegan, but I know, I think she tried it, but I'm pretty sure she eats pretty healthy, has good exercise habits and mm -hmm. things like that like that and, and, and definitely doesn't smoke and takes care of herself. Yeah, I know? don't think we'll see her in the buffet line anytime soon. Yeah, exactly, soon. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but boy, it's hard. You know, and again, when people understand, like, it's not their fault that they love these foods, that's, so that's why, gosh, if you guys have a chance, please read or listen. Listening to it's a little easier, The Pleasure Trap. We were designed for an environment of scarcity. We, Our brains are still in the Stone Age. We weren't designed for Las Vegas. Uh -huh. And so when we're offered all this decadence in the form of food or drinks or drugs or sex, it's very difficult to say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's that you don't realize that they get you when you're a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and that they want to sell you all of the foods that are addictive so you can be a lifetime Absolutely. subscriber to all their stuff. You're so <laughs> right because there's a book out there. Well, there's two books out there that talk about this. One is called the End of Overeating by the former head of the FDA, Dr. David Kessler, and one is called Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. And both these authors talk about how the processed food industry, restaurant industry too, knew that sugar, fat, and salt was addictive, which is why they put them in every single product from baby formula to geriatric formula. And if you're somebody that was couldn't be breastfed, you were having sugar, fat, and salt for the, your very yeah, first maybe. sip of food in the baby formula. And it's in Ensure Geriatric Formula. And and they put it in every processed food product in on the shelves, and you know they even put they even put sugar in cigarettes as if it, that's crazy, all the chemicals it? weren't addictive enough, right? <laughs> yes. So it is it is it is very hard. It's it, you know, and you see people, especially as you get older, you see your loved ones die from really what are preventable diseases when you realize that they're all foodborne. It was the way they ate that caused it, but it's it's tough. And it, if if people could picture that those foods are being actually, you know, there are so many people that would never go to a drug dealer right. or let them push that on them if they would realize that somebody is controlling their chemistry in their brain and they could actually take control back. That's what got and me was when I heard Dr. T you know, when, when I read these books by Dr. Kessler, when I found out that the processed food industry knew that they were selling an addictive product, I just didn't want my brain chemistry any hijacked any further for somebody else's profit. I got mad. And so, uh, you, you know, you're absolutely right. You, 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 especially because we're giving this to such young children. Dr. Furman has a great book out right now called Fast Food Genocide, where he talks about how, how all the ADHD and even violent crime and depression and all the suicide we're having is, is caused by eating these junk foods. Mm -hmm. Food is not even a good name for it. And doing it from, you know, being so young when their brains are just developing. And it is sad, but people, like, they don't see it, like you say. They don't, they don't, it, you know, junk food, animal products, alcohol, even in some places like Las Vegas tobacco, they're socially acceptable, easily affordable, readily available. Everybody else is doing it. So, you know, uh, you know, they make us feel like, like we're, there's something wrong with us yes, for not exactly. wanting to do it, uh -huh. you know, and, uh, like we're the oddballs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, 
and it, and in a way, you know, oh well, we're too extreme and whatever. Well, you know, I I think what they're doing is extreme, but that's okay. You know, Very. It, it's not court appointed program, court ordered program. You get to you guys all get to choose your own health destiny. Mm-hmm. So, I don't remember who did the study, but there was somebody that came to one of our correctional facilities here and actually put um, some of their, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the gentlemen that were arrested and in jail and put them on a plant-based diet. They did get to choose if they wanted to and to do yoga and start meditation. Mm-hmm. And they all turned around. They're, they didn't, the, the, the area of the prison they were in, they weren't violent. It was just incredibly different what it did to their brain chemistry. I believe it. I believe it. And um, uh, they give. I, I volunteered once in a woman's prison, and I couldn't believe like what these women were forced to eat. And you know, there, there was really no vegetables whatsoever, mm-hmm. no fruit. It was all you know. It was like a piece of white bread, you know, in a in a piece of. In, and it wasn't even like. Yeah, I'm. I'm not a fan of bread, just from calorie density and food addiction. But you know, you could argue that some breads are healthier, like an Ezekiel. I mean, this was like literally. They got a piece of white bread that was like in plastic. Mm-hmm. They got like this this juice cup that wasn't juice. It was more like you know Hawaiian punch. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know what the brown stuff was <laughs> on the no. plate, um, but it didn't look very good. And it's like, and they were telling me, like, that I said, you guys don't get any vegetables. He goes, well, sometimes we get, like, some iceberg lettuce. Oh. And a lot of them, like, they have jobs. It's called, like, if they have a crime, like, that they have to pay back. Mm-hmm. It's called, I think they called it restitution. So they can work, I don't know, like, let's say 25 cents an hour or whatever. And they have to give some to who they owe but they're allowed to go to like there's a store and they can buy stuff and what can they buy they can buy like coke and they can buy snickers and they can buy cup of noodles and and so it's it, it, the people that seem that they could benefit the most from good nutrition you know like child like school children mm-hmm. and um and senior citizens and prisoners they, they're getting the worst food possible the cheapest um so, you know it uh, is it is the cheapest my mom used to be a food broker here in town oh. and when she went to the prison system to try to sell them fruit or something, they would too expensive. Too expensive. They wanted to go for the cheapest. Yeah, that's you know, it, it, prison is supposed to be really rehabilitation. Yeah, you know, but they're making them worse. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is a lot worse. And you know, the thing is, is I mean, there would I, I you know I don't I don't do the budget for the prison, but. I'm sure there are foods that they could feed them that would be much more nutritious than the white bread mm-hmm. and that could still have a good rice shelf like beans. rice and beans is exactly yeah. what I was thinking. And yeah, maybe it wouldn't be fresh fruits and vegetables, but God, it would probably taste a lot better, especially if they you know, put a little onion or and jalapeno in it or something. Let them grow gardens. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, that I that wouldn't yeah. cost much. I, and I would think that health or sick care, I should say, that they're probably uh, giving to them while they're there is probably just as expensive. And what about hospitals? Look at how oh they feed gosh, the patients. That's ridiculous. And look at the cafeteria. Actually, the, the hospital I volunteer at, there there is a salad bar, and there is always at least white rice and steamed vegetables. So I mean, I you, you, there is some stuff, but but I mean, I what they see, feed the patients. I had this colleague of mine go into the emergency room. And they said they were waiting on the test. They said, "Well, either you're diabetic or you're you've had a heart attack. We don't know yet." So those were the two possible things. <laughs> oh, no. So while they were waiting, they fed him dinner, and Uh-oh. I was visiting him. And what they fed him was beef stew, milk, whole milk, um, some kind of dessert like it was like apple pie. And I'm like, "This is what you give people that have maybe just had a heart attack." Yeah, it, and, they, and clog their yeah. their arteries. They, and, but, oh I was gosh. talking to one of the physicians here. He says they don't teach us nutrition in medical school. So I, I think there are a few people out there trying to change. That, yeah, though. a few. One of them, one of them that is going to be speaking at your yeah. conference here. Dr. I, Barnard. Oh, Dr. Uh-huh. Barnard is really trying to change policy. He taught you know in schools and, but it's so slow because there's so much money in, in the selling these. I mean, think about it. Like you know, it, it's almost like the processed food industry, which interestingly enough is often owned by some of the tobacco companies. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if. There was a big shift, like in the in the 30s and 40s, it was glamorous to smoke. The movie stars all smoked, and and you know, doctor and, do- it. and doctors <laughs> smoked themselves. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I think it was around the 60s, because I was born in 1960. I remember as a young child, people could smoke in the on the airplane in this grocery store, mm-hmm. in the movie theater.
investigators and then all of a sudden it was like well no you can't do that anymore and they had the the, the warnings on the on the carton of cigarettes mm-hmm. well maybe we should have warnings on processed food because it, it's almost as if once the tobacco industry realized I mean they, they still look people still smoke mm-hmm. but less people I think are starting because mm-hmm. they can't do the ads to the children anymore so it's almost as if when they realized they couldn't make money in, in cigarettes anymore, like they went to processed food because a lot of the tobacco companies own processed food companies because it's the same thing. And that's why, I mean, don't you get mad? Like uh, this is the, I, I, people could just understand that they're doing this for, not for your health, but to make money. Uh-huh. And that's that's mainly one of the and reasons. the children. Yeah, oh, that's Look at sad. the processed meats. It, there should definitely be on processed meats that it can cause cancer. Well, that's like been a, proven. Class yes. one carcinogens, like like the the cured meats, like the bacon's and the, and the bolognese. I mean mm-hmm. that that's just been and been proven. And would you hand your child a bologna sandwich? Hell yeah. No. And then, well, not us. Not but, us. But the I standard American, yeah. and they they wouldn't hand their child cigarettes. Yeah. I I so. don't know if the people just don't know or they don't care. Because I I mm-hmm. think there is probably some people out there that really don't, don't know. know. Mm-hmm. And then there's probably people that don't care but then the group that I'm dealing with they know and they care but they're so stuck in the pleasure trap they've been addicted to these foods for so long that they still struggle to get out and I think that's who I'm dealing because the people that don't know aren't going to know about me right and the people that don't care aren't going to join my program so I'm dealing with people that they know and they care and they still can't do it because it's so hard Mm -hmm. it's so hard it's so worthwhile when you do it but it's hard well I tell you there's there's an interesting thing my mom smoked for like 50 years Mm -hmm. and when we got our health food store um, we ca- we came up, we've come across a lot of really small business owners, and one gentleman found um, he he has a line of herbs that one of them comes from Africa, and it actually turns off your brain where you become addicted. Wow! And my mom, my my husband and I watched her try to quit smoking for years, and we knew stand back, she's gonna try today. You don't want to go near. Her. She started and used that herb. And I, and I was afraid to ask, but I said, so how are you doing? And she goes, I'm fine. I don't care. I don't want to smoke. So if you ever have anybody, come to me, if you ever have anybody that just can't switch that off. What's it this, called? It's Let's... called boa conga. Wow. Uh-huh. And it's Habaleve is the name of the actual product. Jeez, that, that sounds and amazing. It, it is just, it, it is. It, it He makes one for sugar. That's a sugar leaf. That, cool. Yeah. So that is a, a normally... You know, unless you really need an herb or something, I wouldn't recommend it. But this is, it's, I've seen miraculous things happen with it. I see so many, I, I feel like that I butt the heads the most online with people that are either paleo, mm. bulletproof, or keto. keto. Do you ever see any of them come to your group after they're just sick and tired of yeah being sick absolutely and tired. absolutely and they they struggle because um, you know they've been taught that carbs are bad and mm-hmm. I mean they believe that sugar carbs are bad and maybe even fruit. flour and, but mm-hmm. can't eat fruit I can't eat whole grains I can't eat sweet potatoes but they enjoy the food so much more on this program because I mean just eating a bunch of oil and meat how is that satisfying that can't be. <laughs> I mean I, I understand that they have some quick results often in terms of weight loss and some of their numbers but I don't see how it's sustainable just eating a bunch of meat and fat you know it's funny because I saw this girl (laughs) and uh, when we were having a break uh, this was in a class I took hopefully she won't listen to this podcast because she actually you know she's very nice looking has beautiful skin so we were on a break from a class I was taking and me and my friend who's vegan we were having we had some zucchini that we had cooked I had some raw carrots I had some sweet potatoes and she was eating beef jerky and avocado and I'm like, wow. Mm. And and to me, it's like, how is it? It just didn't seem satisfying to me to no. just to eat just a plain avocado and beef jerky. And the, the halitosis that mm. comes with it after a while, and you're not smelling good, and you're probably, I can't imagine that their colons are moving. Yeah, I was going to say, how do they poop? Yeah. I mean, how do people that are on these diets ever poop? I, I did. Uh, it's a really good question. There's no fiber question. in there's animal no. products, and there's no fiber in, in processed fats like oil. So how are these people ever going to the bathroom? No. 
maybe it's just never brought up because yeah. I can't. Maybe it's all the coffee they drink with the butter. Oh I my don't know. God. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I can't. I can't even imagine. Oh, you're you're hyper and you're constipated. Mm. That does not seem like a happy life to me. That's uh, but they they love what they're doing, so yeah. I think it's. Well, I'm glad that, to hear that some of them are coming to you. Yeah, absolutely. When yeah. it doesn't work, or there's just completely, you know, they they can't sustain it. I don't personally know people who have I've I've known people that have lost weight doing those diets, but I don't know anybody personally that's been able to sustain a ke- a paleo or keto diet mm-hmm. because we're supposed to have carbohydrates like 80 percent of our calories complex carbohydrates so our cells run on it yeah our brain our glucose brain. Mm-hmm. so i know that there's that thing called ketosis where the you know when you don't have carbs you convert the fat to to energy but that's not how the body was designed to run and it's certainly not efficient and it's certainly not satisfying like dr mcdougall's always saying dead dr atkins died of his own diet yeah, exactly so well, you know, if if you want to get there, you could always go to the True, True North Health Center mm-hmm. and uh, do a water fest. Yep. That would be the quickest way to You can way still get it. into ketosis, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if juice fasting would do the same. I don't think so because there's too much carbohydrate in those 600 calories or so of juice they give you a day. But I do know juice fasting is, is good for people that do want to change their palate. Right. Oh, yeah. Dr. Lau talks about it all the, all the time because you're not getting any fat. You're not getting any salt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's a wonderful reset for people, you know, mm-hmm. especially if they're not putting like a ton of the sweet fruit in it. Right. And right. doing mostly vegetables mm-hmm. or even, you know, at True North, I know they do watermelon celery often. And I mean, they may use a little sweet fruit, but it's mostly diluted and it's mostly vegetable. Mm-hmm. I think once your taste buds get changed over when you're starting to to drink the juices the greens get a lot more palatable too. absolutely and then foods you start tasting the salt in food mm-hmm. when you know, anytime you stop fasting whether it's a, a juice fast or a water fast you like wow i can really taste food again yes celery tastes very oh, salty it's really and, and charred yeah absolutely mm-hmm. and uh, even tomatoes it's it's all in there mm-hmm. nature you know the other thing that like a lot of people don't understand and I, I didn't for a long time too like I understood that when I read these books that sugar was addictive fat was addictive and salt was addictive and they, they were never found in nature in any concentrated form only in whole food forms but I never realized this is that they're never found together in nature mm-hmm. so you know you might have sh- sweet the sweet taste sugar from fruit even maybe a dried fruit Mm -hmm. and you might have salt from things like greens and you might have fat from nut seeds and avocado but they're never together that's a good thought I've never thought of that and that's what what addicts us what 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 makes the food hyper palatable is the combination of sugar fat and salt so we've got the people like myself that were sugar addicts that like dessert that ate a lot of candies cakes cookies pies and ice cream fat and sugar together Mm -hmm. and then we've got the people that really love their fried food their french fries their potato chips so they're the salt fat combination and then there's you know things like cinnabon which is sugar fat and salt um so and, and then crazy new donuts that they put bacon oh yeah, maybe, yeah I exactly. mean that's just gross. or think about pizza it's like pizza mm-hmm. you couldn't the most craved food generally is is usually chocolate but pizza is always like number two mm-hmm. i mean well, you couldn't have created a more addictive food because you've got the cheese that's addictive, mm-hmm. you got the bread, which is addictive for people that are vulnerable to it, and you know you've got the meat. You know, usually like those cured meats, like mm-hmm. you mentioned, like bacon or sausage or pepperoni, and you've got what else have you got? I'm sure there's sugar in the tomato sauce. Sure, yeah. So uh-huh. you you know you've got the like the trifecta, or if there's a word after trifecta, <laughs> when there's four things, the perfect storm. But people just, I mean. I, they love pizza and and they they it's very difficult for people that love pizza to not eat pizza uh-huh. and again there's no pizza in nature there's no oil in nature mm-hmm. either i mean there's olives and there's nuts and seeds but there's no oil in nature there's no agave or maple syrup in nature there's you no don't see flour. animals out there trying to make oil out of any right foods there's no anything. salt you don't see the cheetah no. you know kill the gazelle and salt it we're the only <laughs> people that do this or the only species that do this and uh, but yeah but it really helped me to realize that it was these combinations of sugar fat salt fat um sugar and salt even sometimes go together in the foods that we make and that they're never they never appear together in nature together it's only the stuff that we make where we put them together and that makes it more hyper palatable and more addictive when when you combine the two just like a speed ball you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah 
and it is it, you can see how addictive, addictive it is you can probably go right down stairs and see somebody standing in line mm-hmm. <laughs> with pizza and you know their soft Fast drink food. And we were at the uh, one of the hotels last night seeing a movie and at the food court that's you know Sparrow's pizza mm-hmm. uh, you know um, just all that stuff you I, th- know? I think it's funny that that uh, People can't go to a, a movie for an hour and a half or two hours without food. Without food. I know. <laughs> I wish, you know, it's funny because I live in L.A. and I'm in the Screen Actors Guild. And so when you go to the Screen Actors Guild or the Director's Guild, food is not allowed. I'm not even mm-hmm. sure if they, I think they might allow water, but you're in these very nice theaters. And and the reason is, is because it's not just because they don't want the theater dirty. It's because it's like disrespectful to the actors mm-hmm. on the screen. Yes. And it's nothing's more, like last night, like the guy next to me was just eating like a jumbo tub of popcorn and I got to listen to that the whole uh-huh, time uh-huh. but believe it or not they make more money on the concession than they do they at the do. film and mm-hmm. so yeah so it's interesting that you mentioned yeah, that the, the, the theater owners I think maybe only get 10% of the ticket and, wow. take, and the rest they, they only make money on the food. yeah so that's mm-hmm. probably why they've well, and, you know yeah. you could argue that a, they could it, oh well actually they have this in Hilton Head South Carolina there's a vegan lady that owns a theater and she only sells healthy vegan food at oh, the theater oh that's cool yeah, oh, so that's worth so, a trip. Yeah, oh so my yeah, gosh. so we actually did when I spoke there. We did go see a movie there, and I, I, I again, I don't enjoy eating in the dark personally. I like mm-hmm. kind of seeing my food yes. when I'm eating it. <laughs> that's a good thing. But 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 again, like people, what should I eat at the movie theater? Well, unless it's like lunchtime or dinner time, mm-hmm. uh, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's a that's a novel concept for yeah. people. Though. I can't even think of the last time I ate at a movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. And, uh, oh, you know what? I take that back. After my husband and I got married, we went to the drive-in, and we brought watermelon. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> oh, drive-ins are a thing of the past, yes. aren't they? Those they were actually fun. have still have a drive-in here. I love it because you can take your dog. That's yeah. like the best part of the mm-hmm. drive-in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Bailey's here with us, that for everybody that knows Chef AJ. Yeah, she, she's very quiet. Bailey, you want to talk to the viewers? Uh, Not no. viewers, the no. listeners? The listeners. <laughs> no, I'll just take a nap. Mm. Thank you. Um, is there anything you want to tell uh, um, our audience about your event that's coming up in Las Sure. Vegas? Oh, I'd love for them to come because I think it's a great event. We have, as our keynote speaker of our well, it's our fourth conference, but it's our second one in Vegas, Labor Day weekend, August 31st, September 1st and 2nd at the Tuscany Hotel. We have the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference, and even if you don't need to lose weight, if you just want to get healthy, consider coming. We call it Ultimate Weight Loss because so many people want to lose weight, but every single lecturer, we just stand for health. You're going to learn that the same diet that's going to make you slim is the one that's going to make you healthy and reverse that heart disease and diabetes and autoimmune disease. This year we're so honored to have the founder and president of PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Dr. Neil Barnard, as our keynote speaker. And also joining us for the first time is Dr. Rosanne Alviera from UC Davis uh, Integrative School of Medicine. And then we have our team of the four of us that always do these conferences, myself, celebrity fitness and nutritional guru John Pierre, who trained Ellen DeGeneres. You can see on his website him uh, working with her. And the co-authors of The Pleasure Trap, Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Doug Lyle. And I think it's going to be a great conference, and they're going to make the food all sofas free. They did a great job last year, and I know they're going to do an even better job this year. And we've got some fun stuff happening, a meet and greet on Friday, a little, what we're calling it a carnival, but it's not like an actual carnival. That's our name for it. On Saturday, we've got boot camp on Saturday and Sunday morning. We've got a yoga class on Saturday and Sunday and also on Friday night and we even have a special added sec- session a bonus session on Friday afternoon at 2 to 4 p.m. with Dr. Doug Lyle where he's going to do an extended Q&A at our, right before our meet and greet and if you uh, take Bailey's name my dog Bailey and add the number 100 Bailey 100 is the code to get $100 off tickets at my website eatunprocessed.com you just click on the live UWL event and we can offer you a hundred dollars off and bringing up John Pierre's name made me think also adding exercise yeah that's when a- you're when you're um, changing your diet that 
brings up your brain chemistry Absolutely. Also, it boosts right? all those positive brain chemicals. Also, what people don't realize, and it took me a long time to learn this because I got the food right before I got the exercise in place, is that exercise is one of the quickest ways to raise your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you, when you have higher self-esteem, you're more likely to stick to that healthy diet. And that's why if you're going to exercise, I really recommend doing something first thing in the morning mm -hmm. so that you get those feel-good flooding of the brain chemistry and, and so that you're, you're at least Dr. Lyle calls it your internal audience and takes notice and says, hey, they must be really serious. And it does boost your self-esteem. It also helps you sleep better and, you know, builds brain health, bone health, immunity health. It's uh, it's great. It's just a win-win. It is. It's, and I think, I think at least for me and for a lot of people, it's the hardest piece. I mean, I do it, but it's like, hey, if there was a way not to do it, I probably wouldn't do it. It's, they call it in the pleasure trap the con the um, motivational triad where we're designed to seek energy, avoid pain, and conserve energy. And boy, we like that. Yeah, and look, at, look at me now. I'm like laying here. You guys can't see this, but <laughs> like we're in this room with chairs and I'm kind of like sprawled out on the floor because there's this little patch of sunshine. I'm, I'm conserving energy. <laughs> um, yeah. my, my mother just turned 77 mm. and she gets my butt going. We walk three to five, four miles uh, several days a week. And she's out there no matter what the weather's like here in Vegas wow. even. So so it's never too late to do this. Nope. It's never too late to want to take care of yourself and feel better. And uh, I thank you for well, everything my pleasure. that thank you, you for, do to help people. Thank you for and I'm, I'm, I want everyone out. to get on your website and look on on YouTube yeah, and see some of your YouTubes. wonderful yeah I got a lot of cooking videos uh, your show I, yeah for like about uh, my, my original show was the chef and the dietitian there's probably 65 video tutorials and then I had a one season of healthy living with chef AJ which was an actual TV show and all 13 episodes are you'll find that and then I've got all, uh, over 75 episodes of weight loss Wednesday on YouTube where um, recently we're doing all recipes now but for the first 75 it was just Q&A for taking live questions so yeah yeah get on get on your computers and start watching <laughs> yep and start eating your greens you don't have to like it you just have to grow up and eat your damn vegetables <laughs> thank you AJ thank you Kim <laughs>